the longer you've been in the real estate market, it's a little bit like dating. You know, you see some people who they've had so many relationships get burned that they, they end up at some phase in their life where they're pointing at problems that maybe don't exist yet. And, uh, you know, with real estate, it can be the same way. Welcome to the Rat Race Rescue, the podcast that proves you don't have to be a rat to win the race. But you can be cheesy. My name is John Lane, and I am the founder of Rat Race Rescue. I'm here to rescue you from the financial maze and help you achieve financial independence through passive real estate investing. We will cover a range of topics, house hacking, increasing rental cash flow, automating your real estate investment business, and working with syndicators to increase your equity multipliers. If these terms aren't familiar to you, don't stress. We're going to break down these terms and help you understand all of them. I've got you covered. We'll talk about tips and tricks to increase your return on investment and share a few goofy laughs along the way. We'll share inspiring real-life stories from guests still struggling financially and others who have successfully left the rat race behind. So whether you're looking to escape the 9 to 5 or seeking financial freedom, sit back, relax, and let's rescue you from the rat race. I want to hear about Max, right? Okay. Uh, I want to hear about like what was your first deal? Um, I want to know you as a person. I, my so, goal is, yeah, yeah. So my so okay. So just starting out from on first deal. Well, okay, we can start with the first deal. Um, I was uh, you know the first deal that was my official first deal that I did myself, which is the one that I'll qualify as that. Um, I was working on a brokerage team in Santa Barbara. Uh, my mm -hmm. mentoring broker was a guy named Steve Golis, a really great broker. Wait, hang on. Are you from Santa Barbara? Carpinteria, which is just about ten miles south of Santa Barbara. Really? Are yeah. you are you living there now? No, no. That's where I grew oh. up, and I moved out of oh, uh, okay. that area when I was uh, twenty six. Oh, I, you know, I was in Santa Barbara this weekend. No, I didn't. I sure did. Yeah, uh, my nephew graduated from school out there. Okay, uh, great. Yeah, so I fell in love with Santa Barbara. Yeah, it's really oh, nice. Wow. Yeah, yeah, it's a really uh, nice spot. Um, yeah, Santa Barbara's great. You know, it's 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 still it's a small market. Smart. Yeah. You know, you might find out if you leave one company, join another company within any industry, you might find out that the company you worked for was the company that was, oh. that does whatever the thing is. Gotcha. Um, yeah. But, uh, but no, I love Santa Barbara. I love growing up there. Um, I did feel in the review mirror, like it was a relatively secluded area where I feel like, I felt like I didn't get a lot of exposure to the world really until I uh, was in college and kind of forced some of that. I traveled a lot in college. Um, I was able to do a couple of different study abroad programs. Did a business study in Europe, and I also did a program called Semester at Sea, which is a uh, you actually get to live on a cruise ship for a, a semester and travel all the way around the globe. Wow. This is about thirteen different countries, and uh, you know, and it wasn't until I started traveling that I really started learning about how much stuff was outside of my small town. And mm -hmm. uh, you know, and my first deal that I did when I was working for the senior broker. You know, I was a member of his team, so I was able to get a lot of experience doing a lot of transactions in a very short period of time in my early twenties, and then. Um, and eventually I wanted to get into acquisitions and, and I didn't at the time, you know, when I started as a broker, you know, I didn't have a lot of exposure to the, the backside of a capital stack or, or how investments were done. We were working with a lot of mom and pop um, owners of multifamily properties. And those owners were, um, you know, generally just the single party individuals. They were placing money for their own personal account. They didn't really have much of a corporate structure. So it was all, all mom and pop. Yeah. And, uh, and the deals that we did, you know, they were high dollar amount because Santa Barbara was a relatively expensive, high barrier entry market, very uh, really? supply constrained still. And, uh, and you know, but a deal in that, in that area, you know, there weren't very many multifamily buildings above 30 units. 30 units was kind of a big property. 50 units was, was large. 100 units, there weren't very many assets over 100 units in, in that market. There were a couple, but not very many. Yeah. And, uh, and we had an acquisitions officer who later became a good buddy of mine um, who used to come through. And, um, and we would talk about deals and eventually, uh, I wanted to get into bigger assets and he connected me with his, uh, old, uh, boss and a company, a guy at a guy named Ben Cattell at a company called Fowler property acquisitions and, um, got picked up at Fowler to do acquisitions. And that was my first education into, um, the world of, you know, really corporate structuring of place of syndicating real estate placing money for investors. And at that time, I really wasn't doing much money placing for investors. All I was doing was doing acquisitions work, was finding deals, underwriting and figuring out how to make them work. And, and it's funny because, you know, when you look back in the review mirror, you know, when you're in your 20s and you really think you know 
everything. And, uh, you know, it is not until you, you know, get further into it that you really go, wow, you know, now I really have a better understanding. You don't, you don't feel like you're kind of holding that match in the dark warehouse any longer. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And, uh, and, you know, and I had the rug pulled out for me pretty, uh, significantly when the recession occurred, the great recession. And, um, and that was one when I had left the industry for a couple of years, not really by choice. Um, but you know, I had guys who were calling me up, Hey, is, is your company hiring? And I kind of was like, you know, I might be getting laid off. And eventually that occurred. Um, yeah. and I was one of the last guys who got laid, um, laid off at that company who really battened down the hatches for a couple of years, uh, between 2000, you know, 10 and 11. And eventually I said, um, you know, I loved the real estate industry and I said, Hey, no matter what, I'm, I'm going back to real estate because I love it. And in that sense, you know, I think that was a really great thing for me because some people go through their careers where they only do one thing and they kind of have this thought of, well, you know, well, what if I had done something else or what if I'd gone to some other industry? And for me, uh, for a very brief period of time during those years, you know, I had to figure out what else to do because there was no transactions really happening. Um, in 2010 and 11, you know, it was just a very, very quiet time in the market. Sure. And, um, and after that, I'd said, you know, I am absolutely sure that I love real estate and I do, I love the industry and I love, and I love real estate because it's one of the few industries where everyone is rowing in the same direction. The, the, um, uh, seller wants the deal to go through the buyer wants the deal to go through both agents or one agent, depending on how many people you got involved, wanted to go through the lenders, wanted to go through your investors, wanted to go through. And in that way, you know, it's a very, it's a, it's a really a big team effort. And, and that's rare in industries, you know, where, um, you know, where you really find everyone who's rowing together. And that's why, you know, you have a lot of relationships with these people you've done deals with where, you know, you've made money together and people remember that. And that's why you go back to work with these same people, you know, over and over again. And, um, let me, let me jump in there. Sure. Let's hear it. You bring up a really good point, right? The, I, one of my biggest gripes about the real estate world is how it's all commission based, right? Yeah. That's to me, that becomes very problematic. Mortgage brokers are commission, realtors are commission to some degree. The, uh, title people are on a, a bonus salary scenario. I mean, I think. You're right. Everybody is rowing the same direction, but its primary motivator is greed, not service. Yeah, that's a true. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, it is true. And, you know, that's one thing that, um, you know, I was really feeling a lot in 21, to, to, uh, 2021, you know, during yeah. that year, 22 as well, but 21 was more so. And, you know, and me going through the last recession, you know, when I saw cap rates getting down to the threes, in some cases below three. There's so, one in Seattle right now that's a cap rate of one. Of one. Is it selling? I no, of course not. Of course not. No. Yeah. So but it is, but it's on the market. It's on the market. Uh, but uh, but you know, but with these um, with these deals, the you know, in 21, you know, we we didn't get I didn't get over my skis. You know, um, and there were a lot of brokers during those particular years specifically. And I don't know if I want to fault them for it, but it was kind of a situation where, you know, a lot of guys wouldn't take a call if you weren't, you know, willing to pay a three cap. And, hey, if you're not willing to pay a three cap, I don't got time for you. And I, and I don't, I don't really want to fault them for that. And, you know, and I, and I definitely understand what you mean when you say the industry is, um, is motivated, you know, in a financial sense, though at the same time, that's. I think also a distinguishing factor when you get into the syndication of, of the actual asset side, because, you know, once you're actually doing your own deals and you're beholden to your investors and you want to be a good steward of capital, you know, that uh, degree of, you know, oh, it, I just made money. It doesn't really hold up any longer. You know, you do bad yeah. deals and it, it catches up with you pretty quick. You know, pretty, yeah. it happens pretty fast. Well, and I don't want to paint a bad picture, right? Greed, <laughs> I'm going to quote Wall Street for a second. Greed is good, right? I grew up in that era that greed is good. Greed is just. I mean, I could actually quote the whole whole movie mm -hmm. line, but I I like I like that everybody's rowing the same direction, but I worry about the guys that are left behind that can't afford the price of admission. Yeah, it's not just the price of admission. It's also the degree to which, you know, the numbers are accurate. 
you know, and that's really what I yeah. see more so. You know, I see a lot of guys I'm, you know, where where if you want, yeah, you know, if you want to be in the industry, then you have to be competitive with the industry, yeah. and that involves. Um, you, I mean, to be honest, you're mentioning something that I, I suppose I do have an issue with in the industry, which is just there's what's considered a race to the bottom in in the industry. You know, which is where you've got. Um, you know, a bid situation, asset comes up for sale and you've got 10 bidders and the asset's the asset, you know, and every guy's looking at it and, you know, some guys are going to underwrite it differently than others. But when it comes down to it, you're going to say, all right, who can implement their business plan the best and who can uh, really figure out what the, the most accurate business plan is and in such and so doing offer uh, a price that also both can get you the deal tied up and also provide your investors with a realistic return on what you can actually raise money for or something that's that's attractive for them to invest in. The, and the term realistic return, realistic returns, realistic returns. Right? Yeah. That, and that's the piece that, I mean, there's financial engineering going on everywhere. In the there world, is, right? there is. And, you know, and those factors are both, you know, a driving factor of the market, which is caused it to continue going up in value. It is that that's, that's a factor that has definitely um, created there to be more value. And that's one thing I look at with multifamily space where I recognize there are new entrants always who are continuing to push capital into the industry. New guys are coming in. They want to make a name for themselves. They're talking to their family. They're talking to other people. And what do they do? They, they get more money into the market. That, that additional capital uh, compresses cap rates because there's more money than there, there is uh, you know, homes for it. And as a result, the returns um, on future deals get squeezed potentially. And in some cases for a lot of companies, there's, there's been studies done. I read a study years ago um, I have it somewhere, but it pretty much stated that metric based um, tracking for deals and for sales. Not just, it wasn't focused purely on real estate, but it's focused on on companies who did metric based tracking uh, resulted in individuals pushing numbers intentionally because that was the only way they were tracked. Yep. And that, that um, was 08, 09, 07. That was definitely a manipulation of the market back then. Um, you know, it's hard to say. It's hard to say, you know, because during the market, during those particular years, you know, that was a, people call it a real estate crash, but really what it was, was one thing else was a liquidity crisis. Yeah. And I'm not really sure if the real estate industry was as uh, much to blame as was the um, subprime uh, mortgage industry, which was lending right. just, you know, bad money out. And that caused a bank, that caused a, a future liquidity crisis where these lenders who were no longer able to, um, their books were so bad they couldn't lend out any more money because they had so many defaults. And then at that point in time, then they th their whole lending department just shut down as a result. Well, and, and I come back to the idea, this is just my own personal theory. We can cut this out of the podcast. No, we can keep it in the straight. Uh, but I it, I call it the, the flip this house crisis, right? Uh, somebody would buy a house for a hundred grand. They'd put fifty into it, and they'd try to sell it for two twenty five, mm -hmm. and they'd have no choice. They could they could not accept a lesser number. They had to have that number because it was all their friends knew it, um, and it just it created this viciousness in the market of. Oh, I just flipped a house. Oh, I just flipped a house. You're right. Everybody you knew was flipping something. Yeah. You know, the investors in the industry for also what kind of what I'm describing within this kind of compression of cap rates and this um, demand to be competitive within the market. To also be clear, capital knows. Yeah. You know, the capital knows. Yeah. You know, the the I used to place money for some very large institutional groups. And, you know, we always had to be accurate with our numbers and we had to write business plans that were implementable. We, and we always knew this. Yep. But, you know, and this also comes back a little bit more to some of the cases of, um, you know, the degree to which you're buying, you know, an A class, C class or B class asset, you know, A class or core, you know, core, core plus, yep. you know, or assets that are significantly more quantifiable than are the value add deals. Because people often say, oh, well, I want a 17 IRR or I want some higher, higher return. But what you see, if you get a balanced portfolio, you know, is that you have, if you, if you did all investments that were these high value add deals where you're, you've got some target rents and, you know, you've got to implement a big business plan you're buying, you know, fifties and sixties and seventies built assets that are old and you don't know what's going on at them. And they're in areas that might have, you know, endemic crime or other problems that are going on. And you, you know, even though all of them have a 17 IRR, that's their target IRR, you'll probably find out you did significantly less in reality. Yeah. 
yeah. um, versus having a balanced portfolio where you have, you know, an asset that's, you know, maybe a core building, literally a brand new building. And maybe you, yeah. the underwritten numbers show that the building is a 9%. But what happens when you look at it back in your review mirror and you find out that probably 9% was the bare minimum case and maybe it even over uh, outperformed that because the 9% didn't have any factors in it that were value add. It was literally just operating the building as is. It had a new roof, it had new designs, it had new operating, it had new electrical systems and new appliances. And all they had to do was buy it, known it, and then find out that cap rate compression comes in and that 9% went to uh, maybe 12 or 14 IRR. And, you know, and, and some of those buildings, that's why with a lot of investors, I try not to tell them, you know, to, to base their returns only on those numbers because, you know, that's, um, there's a reason it's a higher risk asset. You know, they're off, there's a 17 being offered because it's higher risk, you know, and people don't see They don't, they don't always really associate that. They look at this, Oh, it's, it's going to be a 17. I say, well, wait a minute. <laughs> you know, it's, it's really, you know, it's really not guaranteed at that. There's a reason you're buying a 1965 built deal. You know, things happen. It's older. If the market has a correction, you're talking about a um, population of people that are probably the most likely to get hit in the, in the event of not being able to pay their rent. Yep. And, you know, and those factors are things that, um, you know, I try to really, when I talk to investors, try to educate them in regards to, you know, why is it that you're, you, you know, you really want that one return. Um, investors that, you know, put more money out or planting more seeds, I wouldn't necessarily say that you should be chasing a particular IRR hurdle. It's good to have it. It's, I do agree with the balanced portfolio for having, you know, you know, A, B and C class assets. Everybody I've talked to, right. I, I talked to a, a gal today, right. She's, Got a big check coming in, eight hundred thousand, and she wants to put money, place money with me. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, ah, that's a pretty risky. If you got eight hundred, you should be putting at two hundred in A, two hundred in B, two hundred in C. Well, I, or- I think I don't think that's. I mean, I think if she wanted to work with you on a single asset, I think that's fine. I really do. You know. Um, the uh, I am an unproven at, I am a an unproven operator in this market. I know I know where I'm starting at. If right? um, I mean, you know, placing individual dollar amounts in these two. If she's in exchange, yeah, yeah. Is she able to divide out the dollar amounts like that between different deals? Is that is that allowed within an exchange? I kind of thought it had to be. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So yeah, you can you can split it. So with um, I mean, but. You know, this, the larger assets, if she's got 800K, I mean, she could probably get into a larger asset that would probably have a larger return on the backside as opposed to some smaller ones. And the larger ones are also where you're going to get into a um, situation of having, um, you know, more larger institutional groups who are eventually going to be buying those deals. You know, larger assets, they fit into a different buyer category and a different broker category and a different yeah. um, body of people who are going to be buying those assets on the backside. You know, the smaller deals, these deals between... Um, well, 800 K, so I could probably get her into, you know, $5 million asset. Um, she, I mean, it, could, it, it, I would just say it depends on the deal. I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't question yourself on those things. You know, it's, it's, uh, every deal gets underwritten, you know, and, and the, the base levels that we go into as far as underwriting goes, just need to make sure they're all done. And you're an experienced guy. You've been around for a long time. Yeah. You totally understand. I, I, I am in that respect. I mean, I can underwrite. I'm just, I'm so cautious. Yeah, right? you you and I both uh, discussed this. Before. I'm a lot more. You and I have that similar yeah. background, right? You yeah, the, got the burned PTSD. heavy. I got burned heavy. Um, I'm just a lot more cautious going into. I'm very uncomfortable taking a big check uh, because I know I I look at myself. This is just me being super transparent. I look at myself as a new operator. I've got this long resume of things I've done and I've accomplished. But in today's market, 2023, there's a lot of things I don't know. Yeah, but that's exactly the same as everyone else. (laughs) Everyone else is brand new in 2023. Yeah, yeah. You know, we are, we are, we are, we are all newly finding, you know, what's going on today. Um, the, uh, yeah, I mean, new, new construction. Say it again. 
What are your thoughts about new construction? I'm strongly considering going exclusively on new construction. Yeah, you know, I um, I agree with new construction. I do. Um, and I agree with it in the sense that, you know, probably if you start, you know, a project right now and get a shovel in the ground, you're most likely going to be, um, you know, completing that, uh, you know, have, having to be delivered to the market, you know, probably when we're starting the next bull run. Uh, but, but, you know, the factors for construction are still hard, you know, just like everything right now. You know, any deal you're looking at, everything is more expensive. You know, if you're buying an existing multifamily deal, you know, you've got expensive debt, no matter what, more expensive than it was actually. And that's a relative term, but the price is the price. And for construction, your construction price is also the construction price right now. And, um, and whether or not there will be a refinance market during, you know, those later years, that's kind of the big question mark with, um, within the construction space, because, you know, a lot of guys, I I don't want to refinance. I want 100% ownership. I want it all cash. I do not. I don't want to deal with the banks anymore. Yeah, that'd be the best way. And if you can do it, you know, I mean, um, most of us uh, have trouble being sole sole financiers of all of our projects. So we usually have to go to a bank. You know, if you got the resources, then I, I would say, yeah. It, I mean, I'm not, I, I mean, I'm not tooting my own horn, but I got a lot of people throwing money my direction. My my hyper conservative, no bank, the bank personality. Mm-hmm is getting some traction and it's really interesting to me how many people are frustrated with on whatever Friday we had the fifth bank failure right yep. in in as many weeks yep and i think this whole the bank thing is like i think if we if you could put together a group of 20 or 50 investors with enough capital to buy small and just hold and then get it at, at, in a best case scenario, a, a 50% LTV, that would pencil. I mean, I'd much rather pay a investor seven or eight or 9% interest rate. If I have to pay Wells Fargo, yeah, there's, percent, well, yeah. There's several, there's, there's some guys in the market who do a really great job of creating their own debt funds. You know, they, they have a capital stack that's set up where they have a, the first position is, you know, one group of lenders where they say, Hey, you know, or, or investors and those investors have the, the debt p- uh, piece. That's the first promissory note on the asset. And their second piece of the capital stack is their, um, a, you know, a class investor equity, you know, and those are, you know, different ways of, of having that be cut up. But yeah, but that's, that's something that some guys definitely do. Um, and you know, that's um you know you touched on this a little bit ago but you know the financial engineering in the market today is is really a method by which has has come out as a result of kind of what i was mentioning previously with guys trying to figure out how to make deals worth more money yeah you know? yeah and you get these financial products that are coming out where you know are you buy are you really investing in real estate or are you just investing in a 12 percent return on a pref piece and that's secured by real estate, you know, which is yeah. somewhat of a difference, but you know, it's there. And, um, you know, and, and that's part of the reason why, like, you know, we've been looking at some of these different business models and I don't want to go into too much on this call, but, you know, I mentioned that other deal that we're working on this outside of the multifamily space. Yeah. And part of the reason that I really like that opportunity is because, you know, we have this opportunity to create something new that does not have, um, you know, this commoditized, um, arbitraging of cap rate, you know, component where, you know, you're looking to, you know, the multifamily space, you know, you're looking, it's, it's all about, it's all about the basis point spread. And, and that basis point spread is something that is forced, you know, all of us to become so commoditized and, and why the industry has kept having increasing rates, you know, rents literally across the market is because you can people buy these assets and the debt is wildly expensive. And the way to get into the asset is by cranking up rents. And that's what happens on a national basis to every property everywhere. And, um, and it's also the only way the new properties ever get built. Just, just to be clear, you know, people often say, oh, you know, rent should be free. Well, it's not, it's not free for anyone. And often the sponsors who are buying these deals, you know, don't make any money until we sell them literally being the gears. We go years without making any money on them. And then we, we manage them. We deal with all the stuff that's going on. We deal with, you know, whatever issues are happening. We work with them for years and spend countless hours on these things and don't make any money until they sell, hopefully in a good market. And I, I would like to caution every person getting into this business that that is a train wreck of a business model. Which one? Uh, the I don't get paid until you get paid crap. 
That's bonkers. Oh, you mean like a like a like you mean exactly what I do? You for like a yeah. a, a pref equity the waterfall? Yeah. Nope. <laughs> I, nope. I think you nuts. Um, I mean, I hats off to you if you make that model work. We're doing fifty percent. I am not doing these. There's so much capital. Come on, Max. Well, you, you, I mean, so you so you do JV deals on all your stuff, or, or what do you do? Yeah, I'm I'm still doing, still doing LP, but I'm I'm giving them fifty percent of the profits, not eighty and ninety percent of the profits. And that you know, if it works for you, it's great. I mean, I, I definitely don't want to fault it if you, if you got it coming in. I wish I could convince other people to do do it. Just ask people if they're willing to split fifty fifty. Do you automatically just assume 80%? No, I mean, we generally do. The last one that we did, we did a um, 8% pref, and then we did a 70-30 waterfall on the backside. And, um, you know, and depending on the deal that we would do, you know, it's um, it just depends. And sometimes it depends on the equity source that we're getting. It depends on how much work there is involved in the deal. You know, and that's one difference with buying, you know, if you've got a single check writer, you know, or someone who's able to help you to buy lots of deals. I mean, that GP amount can be worth, the juice can be worth the squeeze. Juice sure. can be worth the squeeze, you know, and I, I know. It's a big transaction. And, right? you know, and that's, and we have, we kind of, we've kind of, we've talked about the, the, the philosophy of, uh, of the, the market and, you know, what, what we do in regards to, um, you know, existing in it. So, yeah. you know, my background primarily is it was uh, was placing uh, really doing larger deals. You know, I was um, an acquisitions officer for a company where, you know, we were doing deals between, you know, small deal was 30 million, large deal was, you know, 150 million. And, um, you know, when when you're working on deals of that size, you know, it's a different ballgame. You're not you're gener generally those people who are placing capital at that level um, already have the money in a bank account. And that's what made my job at that time, you know, relatively streamlined. You know, I was able to just focus on buying deals. But I'll tell you, when I was doing that, I was very, very bored. I was. I was very, very bored. Um, I wanted to do more. I didn't feel like I was able to. And I felt like my brain was was getting, um, I felt like my brain was shutting off, to be really honest. And that's what, and that's what I love about what I'm doing now is, is, is structuring this in other ways. And, you know, and to your credit, you know, the JV model or, or having something where you're, hey, I found this deal and I'll split the profits with you, you know, 50 50. Um, are you taking ACK fees or do you, do you not take any ACK fees or you do you take ACK fees also? You'd love to take me through your model. I'd, I'd love to see how, how you work that out. On on the larger assets, you know, we generally don't want to work on a, um, we, have, we have threshold amounts that will, that would make it of interest for us to do it. And if, and if it doesn't hit those threshold amounts, we don't do it. We just pass. And that's how we um, ensure, you know, that we're making a certain amount of money on each deal and, and making sure that the investors stay happy. And some of that stuff, you know, ranges. And that's why, you know, with some of these deals, you know, I, I used to say, oh, you know, heavy value add, no big deal. Let's figure out how to make the numbers work. I, I'm not really in agreement with that anymore. And because you can, you can take on a deal and a project and I see them all the time. I, I in fact, I had one that I was working on not too long ago in, um, in San Antonio and, and, uh, it was. It would have been a nightmare to um, renovate this property. It had. It had endemic crime. There was a murder on the property within the last six months, and you know, and um, and the broker who brought the deal didn't really recognize how severe of an issue that murder that happened on site was. You know, and um, kind of said, "Oh, it's not a problem. You know, you can. Um, you property can take a supplemental." And I'm like, well, "How do you know that?" He's like, "Well, the seller told me," and this broker who brought it was not aware that that was not that simple to do that, do that way. You know, the lender could say, no, I'm not going to provide a supplemental because the crime statistics are now, you know, too bad in the area. And it's also an issue where if we were to buy the asset and we're going to go sell the property, this could still show up, you know, on yeah. the property's history, in which case yeah. even the buyer who's buying it from you could get, you know, bad terms on the backside. And, you know, and, and you, you inherit these problems on these deals and, you know, you got to make it, make sure it's worth it now. Um, but that said, you know, we have a certain threshold that we hit. I don't want to say what that is, you know, particularly on this call. Yeah. But um, but we have to make sure that it's worth it, not just to us uh, specifically as the sponsors, but to our investors and also to all the people who we work with. Because it's never just, you know, it's never a solo game. You know, if I'm bringing in you to raise capital for a deal or something else, you know, 
we have to make sure that the deal has enough um, juice in it to be able to um, be lucrative um, offer to, you know, John Lane or someone else. We say, Hey, we've got this opportunity. Um, And that's the same thing for guys who bring us deals. Guys call us on deals and they say, Hey, you know, I got this deal. Can you help out? Can you, can can I bring it to you? And can you, you know, raise money for it? And we can help with asset management or whatever it is. And, you know, even for that individual who brings us the deal, we have to make sure the deal has enough, enough juice in it. Um, you know, smaller deals, which I, I do like, you know, um, we have kind of a different way of working on the smaller ones because we have to make sure that um, that they're still profitable. And, and in this market, we've definitely looked at a lot of smaller real estate that we wouldn't have looked at previously. And that's because, you know, it's just hard to find larger deals that pencil. There, there hasn't been yet, and this is, this is yet to be seen in the market, but we haven't yet seen in this economy true pain on the seller's uh, part. Um Yet, you know, there, there, there are some, the guys who were in pain are the guys who bought, uh, on bridge and who didn't buy rate caps or, um, had a sub one DSCR and they were expecting some pro forma numbers to hit that within, you know, I'll call it the subsequent two years. Those are the deals that are really hit right now. But a lot of guys who maybe bought a deal and they got really cheap financing, which was available in 21, um, and put it on for, you know, 10 years and it was a core deal probably going to be just fine. They'll probably read through this and, you know, not really notice it, but the guys who, who had to hit performing numbers in an economy where their target rents are probably going to be more impaired are the ones you're really um, getting squeezed right now. But that's not the, that's not the total of the market. Um, there are some other product types outside multifamily that are potentially getting, you know, more hit, you know, the office space is what everyone's seeing frequently now is something that's, um, you know, really people are wondering what that's going to look like. You know, and I and that's a space where I wonder, you know, if there will be some kind of occupancy or I'm sorry, vacancy tax that cities eventually implement um, to I, to encourage encourage you know uh, owners to drop rates. But we'll see. I'm wondering about that. I found, you know, my penchant for brick hundred year properties. Yeah, I found a really interesting. Uh, 1920s, early mid century. Uh, it's currently a uh, office building, 38% occupied, and it's gorgeous. And yet, I really hesitate. I mean, the price is good, the, the math is good, the location's amazing, everything, it checks literally every single box except. It's an office instead of multifamily. And I keep wondering in the back of my, my head about, could I convert it into multifamily? And it has 15 parking spaces in a downtown core. I mean, it's, it's a pretty awesome spot, but... You know, some of those I projects... Know, I wonder about the next the next phase, right? You're talking about the pain in the market. I think this pain in the market is going to bleed into office. I think it's going to bleed into the multifamily. Yeah, I, 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 I get worried about the office space because I get worried... Well, there's, there's several things I worry about in the market. I worry about the office space because of the similar thing I mentioned on the subprime lending thing prior. You had lenders who were lending to... Um, people who couldn't afford their, their mortgages. And that caused the entire lending arm, Washington Mutual, whoever, Lehman Brothers, to go BK. And within the office market, you know, there are, there, that's that's the, kind of the same thing. You have these companies that are lending out money and you could have this this factor where one portion of the portfolio takes such a big hit that it affects the, the whole portfolio in general. Yeah. And, you know, on a, on a maybe 10 or 15 year outlook, I get very concerned about vacancy in the market as a result of the boomers um, passing away. Yeah. That's, um, that's something that I, I see and I go, you know, because we talk about, you know, population decline or how that's really because it's supposed to be such a major factor in China, but also in the U.S. and really all over the world. And I look mm-hmm. at a lot of these older assets, you know, 60s, 50s built, 50s or 60s built buildings where I go, gosh, you know, um, what, what are these going to be eventually? You know, how are these properties really going to be um, operating when you end up with, you know, potentially, um, you know, 20% of the, the size of the U.S., you know, dropping away from um, the, the, the population within the next, you know, 15 years. Yeah. And, um, and that's something that I, I don't, I don't know. 
I don't know. I mean, the, the senior living communities um, took a very big bull run within the last 10 years also, and they're probably expected to take another you know, uh, bull run within the subsequent 10 years. But after that, I wonder how many of these properties will really need to be um, in operation. Yeah. And, um, and in cores of middle America. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, you know, so those are some of the large factors that, you know, make me concerned. There's, um, because we haven't seen that yet in the U S where, where the supply has, um, exceeded the demand in the market. And I'm, you know, and this, as I'm stating this, this is an outside concern I've got. I, I have never, I haven't read anything that's really had this be like a, you know, looming thing on the horizon. And I am someone who agrees that we've got, you know, massive inflation, which is really um, the only thing is going to be hedged by is going to be real estate. So, you know, I'm still a believer that, you know, we're going to see a really sharp V in, uh, in, in the real estate space and that, you know, investing in, in real estate is really going to be the best thing to do um, here within the next 10 years. Um, but yeah, you know, there's office spaces that need to be converted. You know, how old was that building that you're mentioning? Oh, it's a hundred years. Hundred years old. You know, I, I I've always been relatively cautious on hundred year old buildings um, for the uh, the cost to renovate them because you've got you get some buildings that are um, you know eighties built and you know something happens in the wall you, people know how it's framed and you can go in there and fix it. You get some old Victorian building, a brick building, something that has you know um, some work where you have to bring in specialists, and wow. that's when you can. Wow. Really have yeah massively balloon ballooning costs and there was a deal I worked on years ago um, that was a, a former um, it was a converted factory that had been um, changed into these different um, floor plates that uh, were these um, kind of loft type spaces and it was actually a really killer project it really Kentucky, was all through Kentucky has beautiful loft spaces like yeah that. like that and um, you know in California we haven't really had you know much opportunity to have those those types of projects um, not like not like um, back east or in the Midwest at least but uh, but you know some of those projects I really love seeing and um, if we could find more I'd love to work on them I would I would I, I would I, it, I there are some like back east on the west coast and we're not old enough right you you go back to boston and it's a 500 year old city you go to seattle and it's a hundred year old city right i mean mm -hmm. the oldest building in portland is 1880 that's the oldest building in portland mm -hmm. um, we just don't have those old style buildings and you're never going to get those cool lofts and you're never going to get the, the, yeah, we just, we don't have that on the West coast. Yeah. The, um, but you know, that just goes into, you know, we're trying to find projects that are different. You know, I like the idea of doing projects like that for that kind of comment we had earlier where I don't want to have a race to the bottom situation on returns. Um, but yeah, but I understand why real estate has the investment cachet it does of being a secure asset and secure investment. You know, it, it's, um, I don't want to say it's hard to lose money, but I, but I would say that, you know, assets that are underwritten correctly within a rising market are going to have better return profiles than, you know, um, stocks, you know, or some other investment. In, in all cases, right? Yeah. I mean, what, what the thing you specialize in, your higher ticket, like I want to uh, go back to our conversation earlier you tend to focus on thirty million dollars or more. Well, well, I, I used to. I used to. So, let, yeah, just to, just to clarify, that was back when I was at my old, you know, corporate corporate life, um, which is different than what I do now. You know, and what I do now is we're we, you know we're working back to get to that. But no, I mean the deals that we work on now um, are significantly smaller, and we're looking for assets. You know, our our if, our box right now is assets as small as 2 million up to about 15 million. And that's where we're, and that's where we're focused. I just shifted. All yeah. right. Well, and you know, and there's a lot of reason for that. And you know, and I don't shy away from talking about this, but we're a young company. You know, my business partner and I started this, started uh, Geometric RE in fourth quarter 21. And we, um, and we've been doing well with buying assets, but you know, but when you're placing checks and you're starting to, you know, you need to, to build your investor, uh, 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 List. You just have to build your investor list and people who trust you with money. And um, 
you know, and that's where we're just building that out. And, it, and it's and it's not a quick process. You know, I mean, you start out and you're able to, you know, cobble together, you know, some friends and family, you know, 50K, 100K, you know, something like that. You do another deal and you find, you know, the previous people you went to are now out of money. Now you yeah. got to go to 100K, 200K, and you start going to larger check writers, family offices, and other groups. And, um, you know, and we're going back to that size of the larger assets. You know, that's that's the direction that we're going. But, you know, we'll get, we'll get there when we do. It's not it's not something that we're demanding for the current time being. If we had a if we had a bucket of money that was in in the bank right now, even with the market where it is, we'd probably still have to be really cautious. I probably still wouldn't change our our size of deal that we're looking at because we're just looking at it and finding the next opportunities. We're finding opportunities where we can. And a lot of the larger assets, you know, I haven't seen um you know, we're looking for the sellers who are market sellers. You know, there's a lot of guys who are who are just owners. And what I mean by just owners is Hey, I'll sell my building for X price. And you say, well, what if you don't want your number? They go, well, then I'm not going to sell it. And then you look at the market and you look at what your cost of capital is, you know, from both your investors and what you're going to, you know, borrow from a, a lender for. And you find out that, you know, they're 30% over, you know, what anyone can pay for their building. And that makes them not a seller at all. It just makes them an owner who wants a lot of money for their, for their asset. And, um, and, you know, and we're not looking for those guys. You know, we're looking for the guys who are actually market sellers in today's market. And um, and we're still conservative. You know, everything that I'm underwriting still has been, um, you know, I, I, I look at numbers and I see a lot of guys who offer stuff that I look at. And I just go, hey, look, like this has got a lot of risk associated. And um, and that's a for better or for worse quality. You know, I feel like... Um, you know, the longer you've been in the real estate market, it's a little bit like dating. You know, you see some people who they've had so many relationships get burned that they, they end up at some phase in their life where they're pointing at problems that maybe don't exist yet. And, uh, you know, with real estate, it can be the same way where you get some people who jump in in the market and, you know, maybe if it's a bull market, they don't, they can't do a bad deal because the market just keeps going up. Yeah. And, um, you know, and that next wave is really what we are, are, are paddling in to catch right now. And everyone is really, I mean, we're, we're, there's a recognition that some people know there's a, you know, light at the under other side of the tunnel. They can't, but they can't quite see through the tunnel yet. Not yet, but they know it's there. You know, the tunnel's so far, they can't quite see the light yet, but, um, but it is there and, um, you know, and, and time moves forward. So, you know, you can learn from, from the past, but don't look that direction. You know, you gotta be paddling forward. You gotta be constantly rowing into the, into to catch the wave. And, you know, and, and what we're doing right now, we're looking for our next deal, but we're also working on our marketing, we're working on our stuff that really will assist us with being able to, um, to, you know, uh, be competitive in the market on a large scale. That's pretty awesome. Max, how do people get in touch with you? Let's stop. Uh, let's kind of get that piece. Sure. Uh, so Instagram underscore Max Gonzalez underscore uh, or our website, uh, geometricre.com. And uh, the website, you know, we've got a very simple investor form that's on there. And, you know, you can get access to our um, our investments. We don't generally, uh, actually, we don't at all. Um, the only thing we send out are investment opportunities. You know, there's a little bit of communication on, uh, you know, what kind of investment you're looking for. But for anyone who wants to get in touch and just wants to see, you know, what they can invest in, you know, reach out. Um, we invest in markets that we know, um, high growth markets um, in the country, um, Phoenix, Texas, and Southern California. I know a lot of people look at Southern California and it kind of freaks them out, but, uh, but it's also high barrier to entry market, um, which, you know, once people actually invest in the market, they, they kind of start recognizing uh, what the benefits are on a long-term basis of having an asset in, in such a, um, uh, supply constrained area. And, um, and we, you know, and there are the guys who send me deals in other locations in the country. And generally, you know, we want to be experts in whatever we're, we're working on. And, um, and that's, you know, cause sometimes, you know, they might, someone might send me a deal in Seattle and I might look at it and say, you know, I think this could be a good deal, but if I don't know the market well enough, you know, that's something that we just don't want to get the wheel for. So we, we want to be specialists where we're investing. Thank you for tuning in to Rat Race Rescue. If you enjoyed today's episode, we invite you to like, subscribe, follow, and share our channel with your friends and loved ones. For more great content and helpful resources, check out ratracerescue.net and escape the rat race today.